following the beats presentation on um, on black swans and on sort of the rumbling. And I think that it's fair to say over the past few years, there has been a lot of rumbling around the agency evolution and, and what's the role of the agency and what, and, you know, what are these turf wars all about and, uh, and who's gonna be doing what in the coming years. So I think it's really uh, a good place to start when we, uh, if we ask Ai, um, you know, what is your view of the role of an agency in today's so in 2006 marketing. I think the role for them is really to be our partner. So one of the things that we're doing at Scotia is really uh, staffing up on expertise and making sure that we've got the right people in the room on our end to talk about all of these, you know, about MarTech, about ad tech, about, um, you know, media buys. Uh, so we're staffing up. And so we've got the experts in the room, but we rely on our partners to really help us execute that, that vision. And so in a data-driven world, and I know we're going to get into this a little bit later, um, but that requires a lot of trust um, in this day and age when people are collecting a lot of data and using that data to, to create experiences and, and, uh, and to develop their marketing plans. So um, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about sharing that data and, and having so many different people touching that data? Uh, first of all, I think for us as a bank, you know, we need to make sure that our data is secure. So you know, we are taking steps to take that in-house because that's something that we need to own. Um, and so we've got internal experts who, um, who are really the owners and the stewards of that data, and I think that's really important. That's not to say that our, our marketing partners um, don't have access to it, though, and that's the big part. There is a lot of trust needed there, um, and that's why we need to have very solid partnerships with creative agencies and, and with our media agency partners. Thanks, and, and Matt, um, in this sort of changing environment, as the clients are starting to staff up more and more, mm -hmm. um, how how does that change the way that uh, that media agencies are servicing clients, and, and what kind of considerations are you putting towards these new sort of dynamics? There's uh, there's definitely never a one size fits all model. Yeah. That'd be too easy, okay. and and so we really need to be adaptive, dynamic to our client needs, and and like many agency media agency gold <laughs> coast. Uh, in the market, we're on a continual evolution over the past number of years. So if you think of five or 10 years ago, there were very siloed, digital, and traditional teams. Then about three to five years ago, a lot of agencies, including agencies with the Nike Media Brands, focused on shifting the hybrid models, traditional digital strategists. And now we've come to the realization where you need a very strong business partner and a client business team supported by digital centers of excellence to tap into, when needed, digital specialist expertise to seamlessly bring in and provide that integrated solution to clients. Okay. Um, so, Ian, um, you know, I used to work at a creative agency, and we talked about this earlier, um, where uh, it's really easy for a media person to walk into a creative agency and sort of say, why are you guys spending all this time building this creative when you can just, I don't know, call BuzzFeed or, or call a third party and they can build that creative for you? Um, how do you make the distinction and how do you make those kinds of decisions on what to outsource and what to, um, what to keep as your own? And, and do you think that the lines are blurring on the creative agency side? And maybe you can talk a little bit about your business model because I know it's a little bit unique. But uh, how are those lines blurring for you? Um, and and you know, where do you draw the line between a medium and a message and, and, and all that sort of stuff? In terms of finding the right uh, partner for the right job, I think it's about building a network of uh, partners you can trust, who are subject matter experts that you can go to and you know what they do and they do it well and they do it better than you're ever going to do it and making sure that you're aware of uh, those capabilities and you're always out there looking at uh, what other people are doing and then knowing what you're good at and getting better at what you're good at. I mean, uh, it seems that we're in a moment of time in creative advertising where we have an opportunity to rethink the, the traditional model where you have like this creative idea at the center and uh, on a good day, everything works kind of in service of deploying that creative idea down through the channels. Um, but with the complexities of programmatic and algorithmic and data, um, there's, uh, it's probably too complicated for uh, like creative people or a creative-led agency to sort of manage all that with that model. So I think the, the model we're pursuing is bringing uh, data and technology, automation and strategy and create it to the table at the same time at the beginning of the project, we can make those determinations of what's the best way to proceed. Do we need to bring in other partners? Do we have the capabilities in house? Mm -hmm. That's really refreshing to hear. <laughs> <laughs> totally refreshing to hear because I think there's a lot of dinosaurs still uh, on the creative agency side who don't think like that. 
Uh, so that's great. And we find most success in the, in the IMC model with clients, the integrated marketing communications model, where we have, uh, you know, from upstream planning all the way through to execution, we want that one team approach. And if you mentioned, you know, there needs to be a conductor, right? And for us, um, I think we're kind of seeing ourselves as that conductor. We've got to be the owner of our own face. But we also need that orchestra, right? And I think that having partners who are agile, who are dynamic, will really help that. And just to return to the, uh, one of the threads of your question, um, how do we service a client who has an in-house marketing department that's really good at a lot of what they're doing? I think it's partly just being a good partner and saying, okay, you have, so you have a marketing department, what are you guys good at, and how can we do something that it's an augmentation or a layer to that? So we're not trying to duplicate or compete with an internal uh, marketing group. Um, a lot of, thank you for that, um, a lot of, uh, you know, the trend seems to be marketers taking things in house as we mentioned, um, and a lot of it seems to be driven by this notion that, and I, I, you know, maybe again, uh, talks a little bit about this, about the automation of marketing, marketing automation is, is obviously well in its, you know, well in course right now. Um, and that it's becoming easier, the perception is, is that buying media is sort of an easier process now that it's automated. And, and I have a question that, that um, you know, it, it's a little sensitive uh, for, you know, maybe for Matt. Um, and, you know, we saw a slide earlier that said that 85% of impressions are running through uh, the, the two bigger uh, US-based uh, publishers. Uh, how, how in, in that climate, are you able to, um, to make recommendations that, uh, that are sort of outside the box? If, if, you know, if all of the volume is going through to major players, uh, and media uh, age, or uh, brands are starting to think, okay, well, I want to bring that stuff in house anyways, and it'll be automated. Um, you know, what's your recourse? What do you, what, you know, what do you, what do you say to that? And how do you bring options that are outside of those two? Uh, so to your first point, I think yeah. most of us can agree in this room that automation has not simplified things right. um, yeah. yet. yet. Right. We'll get there, hopefully. And, uh, and so I'll just call that out. And then secondarily, I'm not, I'm not sure where that stat came from in terms of 85% of spend with Google and Facebook um, as an agency called Google. We're nowhere near that. Uh, but of course, they're number one and number two. And it, you know, our approach at IPG Media Brands is, is open. So an open technology approach, we don't tie ourselves to any one specific platform or inventory sources. And, and we optimize and buy audiences and inventory and leverage technology based on best performance. And of course, there are preferred partners that rise to the top, and that's because they're performing better. The Googles of the world and the Facebooks of the world have extremely valuable and high-performing audience data. So it makes sense. Um, is it a challenge? Yes. Um, but again, if you have an open technology approach as an agency working with clients, then, then you will test other up-and-comers from a technology perspective or different use cases that different um, ad tech platforms, for example, can provide or different data sets you know, that we have access to to understand um, do those work in comparison to the, to the big guys. Do you feel that you guys are doing enough of that, experimenting with different platforms as they come knocking on your door? I, I do. So we have, you know, through Cadre and a programmatic and that type of unit, we have a roster of, of, of over 20 DSPs um, that, that we continually test, test and learn bake-offs of our San Francisco product team to hold, you know, every six months these platforms accountable for, for performance so we can advise our clients and consult with our clients. And I think that's the big thing now. It's too much for clients to understand. Um, you know, maybe if, if, if you're a bank, you have the opportunity to have how many people? 400. 400 people within the marketing team, and you can have specialists, but a lot of clients in Canada don't. So they rely on agencies to consult, to provide an unbiased view uh, of how to extract the maximum value to partnerships. We actually really do look to our agency um, for those POVs on what's new and what's up and coming. So, you know, even though we are 400 people, um, you know, we know that our agency has a lot of that insight that we just don't have the time to look at. So with that investment in, in, um, in ad tech uh, that you mentioned, uh, how does a conglomerate or like a, a bigger sort of you know, open company remain objective when it comes to offering options that sit outside of their network, right? Outside, and I don't want to call it a wall garden because it's such an overused term. And it's kind of, you know, I don't want, I don't mean to put it in a negative light, um, but you know, you have a portfolio. Um, and, and what are the chances of you moving outside of that portfolio if the opportunity is the right one for your client? 
Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the chances are high for the board. So again, it comes down to the, the nature of the agency network. We're, we're very open. We don't own any technology. We partner with the best in green technology and bring that to our clients. And clients go with a number of different models. We consult with clients. Clients can bring us a specific partner, like if they work with Adobe, for, for example, and we work you know, within that framework. That's great. Um, for record for action moment, um, Guy, when you were talking about 400 people in your marketing team, um, can you tell me what uh, the structure was 10 years ago versus your 400 today? So oh, I wasn't there 10 years ago, but uh, 10 years ago it was very much a traditional marketing team, um, and now you know we've really grown the digital discipline, and that's uh, from performance people who are really you know performance driven to uh, brand people who understand how a brand behaves in a digital world. Um, it really is kind of that first question that we ask now is, you know, how, what's your, what's your digital knowledge and how would you know about the industry and how, how do you see this bank um, working in a digital world? So, um, you know, it, it's very different. It's continuing to evolve. Um, and I absolutely think that, you know, our next hires are all gonna be digitally savvy and understand, you know, data and marketing. Um, in ways that 10 years ago people did. So that's interesting. And Ian, um, you know, we're talking a lot about data, and, and obviously you guys are, are knee deep in it now. Um, when we're looking at hiring um, for your disciplines, what is the biggest sore spot? What is what is lacking? Because you know, when you're looking at data from a from an insight gathering perspective, I, I know that that's a little bit different than um, maybe doing mm -hmm. linear sort of transactional decisions with data, like a, from a pure media planning strategy side. Um, but using data to, to drive insights that are going to drive a creative strategy um, requires a really uh, specific discipline. How hard is that to find? Well, it doesn't, and it doesn't. I, this whole thing reminds me a lot of the initial shift to digital that advertising did 10 years ago. And there were those who kind of ran in headlong into the mystery and what they didn't know, and like, geez, tech, uh, technology's hard, digital's hard. Um, and there are those who ran headlong into it and said, you know, I know. I understand that I don't know, but I'm comfortable and I'm gonna embrace the discomfort and we're gonna figure it out as we go. And there were those that uh, were more fearful and uh, decided not to pursue. And I think um, the only difference between those two people is a, a willingness to embrace the unknown and the discomfort. So yeah, there's gonna, you know, when we're looking to hire, we need people who have um, maybe a, a subject matter specialization or, you know, and that's gonna be really important and that's just table stakes, but overall, more broadly within the agency, we are looking for people who just don't have that fear, or if they do, they're comfortable with the discomfort of not knowing, because all this stuff is really hard. I mean, as a creative person, you know, talking about data and technology and programmatic and algorithmic and AI, and like how that's gonna influence a creative uh, campaign, it's all, it can be overwhelming. Um, but we don't all have to be subject matter experts. We can just be uh, good at the thing we do, and then with that willingness to embrace what we don't know. Um, with the, um, the native advertising trend moving upwards, uh, there is uh, an increasing demand for higher volumes of content um, to be spread online, and it's uh, you know, obviously programmatically uh, available and all that sort of stuff. Um, at you know, one of our conferences this year, uh, there was a little bit of a, a you know, a, again another sort of record scratch moment where, some, where uh, Sherry was talking about um, you know this idea of uh, there's an automated process to writing headlines. Um, and so, uh, so there's, it's like a, you know, you type in your text uh, and then basically uh, AI takes over and through data, um, uh, through data analysis, David, uh, you know, it, it starts to rewrite your lines for you based on everything that it knows uh, that uh, people will click on. And also that stat about, I think it's 89% of people only read the headline and, and not the actual content. So headlines are very important. Um, Ian, does that infringe on your territory uh, in terms of you know creative space and like how do you feel about that? Um, I John think had a, John Finkelstein had a very strong opinion about that. Did he? I I, I have mine is different than his. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> John's amazing, but I don't know. I, I you could see, and I don't know what his opinion is, but um, I think you could see it as the displacement of creativity, um, or you could see it as an opportunity for a creative renaissance. And I think this is like, for me, this is where design thinking comes in. Someone at some point has got to design that algorithm and think that through of how that thing's gonna work. And I think if, uh, you know, we've got creative people on our team who are tasked with like, okay, we're gonna build this thing, it's gonna be automated, there's gonna be templates involved, how can we bring creativity up to a higher plane in how we design the whole system? For me, that's design thinking, and 
I, I do think you, in order for to be good and for our, in order for us to be doing our job as a creative agency as storytellers, as doing the thing that our industry, our industry is built on, which is you know brand building and storytelling, we have to figure out how to uh, make it work. And I think that's at the design thinking level on how we're building these systems. So, and Guy, what, what's your opinion on that? Is that a new shiny toy for a marketer? If you're going to be taking programmatic in-house and, and doing sort of performance marketing in-house, uh, do tools like that appeal to you? Or, or is that something that you would draw a line somewhere in the sand and sort of say, mm, I'm going to stick with my creative agency. I'm going I'm to stick with their governance as opposed to automating my whole process despite the fact that the numbers show that this may, be, may or may not be more effective. I mean, for us, I don't care who comes up with the idea and who does it. It's, is it going to perform? What are my results going to be? What are the metrics, right? I don't, whether it's the creative agency, whether it's a BuzzFeed, whether it's a, um, you know, share through, any of those guys, I don't really care. I just want the results, and that's, that's a different mindset than I kind of had when I was at the agency. Um, you know, it was very much a, you know, how do we, push this forward for me at the age, or, or at, at Scorsia Bank now, it's, it's about who, having all the partners at the table, but not caring who does what. So, you know, um, that, that creative piece could come from anywhere. This, uh, this whole discussion, it's a great opportunity for creative agencies, because I feel like we've become very transactional as an industry, very tied to the loss of the humanity with the media. So how do we begin to put humans and individuals at the center of everything we do, and, uh, and how do we uh, use that data to unlock more creativity through creative partners to de develop more personalized, more relevant messaging and creative against those high value audiences? Because we have to move away from this one size fits all matching luggage mm -hmm. um, mentality and, and strategy. And that have, you know, that's a combination of behavior change on client side, creative agency side, and I like the matching luggage term, and I was going to actually, I was going to throw in a question about which buzzwords does everybody love and hate. But um, uh, the matching luggage question is one that I, I'd like to, to sort of bring up, just in light of the um, all the, the noise this year about ad blocking. Uh, despite the fact that 78% of consumers prefer an ad-supported environment, 17% of Canadians are still using ad blocking, according to our study, um, and uh, apparently in Germany it's on, on the decline. So that's good news for us. Um, the biggest factor was uh, annoyance. How is that impacting your decisions, and how is that impacting the way that you're going to start, you know, creating strategies moving forward? Um, I, I wonder, you know, from a creative agency standpoint, uh, does matching luggage, you know, is that sort of a, a couple of nails in that coffin, um, where you're going to start moving towards other strategies? And so, what, is, what do they look like? It feels like the problem that has haunted us since we've always been making bad ads. Um, if, no, people don't, right. if people don't want to watch a bad ad, they're going to they're gonna find a way not to watch it, hopefully, mm -hmm. hopefully unless we're really annoying and really get up in their face with it. Um, so, I mean, I think uh, lots of uh, brands are doing a good job of uh, playing in different channels, and uh, if you know, people are blocking pre-roll, then uh, either they don't find it valuable, or uh, they find it annoying, or worse. Um, I, I think for me, it's kind of retreating to the fundamentals of what is good storytelling. How can we uh, put messaging and service of brands to affect uh, behavior change? Um, we have a tool at FCB uh, Global, um, we call it a six point uh, creative review scale. So we actually can ask ourselves when we are evaluating a piece of creative is this destructive to the brand? Is it, is it invisible? It's two, goes all the way up to uh, four, five, and six. Kind of a, uh, for us, it's a, a never finished. Um, idea and the the idea about uh, matching luggage, you know, I think there needs to be a kind of a red thread that runs through a, a marketing program. Um, but you know, to, to Matt's point around one to one and the specificity of knowing who we're talking to, I think that makes it harder and harder to do a one size fits all thing at the end because everyone's an individual and um, brands that are doing it right are able to talk to individuals as individuals. So it's, what's your favorite format though? Like today. What's your, you know, what was the last piece that you worked on that you thought, this is really cool, you know, and it's not matching luggage. It's a different format. It's something that we think we feel really strongly about. Like, what was it? Or can you just, can you describe one of the projects? Um, well, I mean, we, we've done, uh, we did something for the Nestle uh, Baby Program, and it was kind of a, it was struggling to modernize, and uh, I think our insight was that they had been focused on a really narrow window of conversion. Um, when, uh, 
the baby's first in the world, and uh, there's about a 48-hour window where they might try formula, and if they, if they get to that formula, um, they're unlikely to switch after that. Breast is best, by the way. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, uh, formula can play a valuable role as a companion. Um, I have to say that. Hey, ladies, you never expect to hear on the um, so anyway, I, I, I don't want to get into all the details, but we built a full life cycle um, uh, for the Nessie Baby program that started well before they, uh, she had her baby and uh, supported her with that match the product life cycle uh, from maternal all the way through to solid foods. So um, it was really understanding her journey and making sure we had content, um, and tons of different kinds of content and had units that matched her journey and was hopefully providing value. Great. And so in your in your sort of strategy and thinking, um, you know, uh, this is a, another question that I want to ask all of you is, uh, is mobile leading? Like, is, is the mobile experience starting to lead your, your sort of thoughts uh, in the way that the three are to roll out? Or, or is it still overarching, uh, maybe, you know, web content, and then a, maybe a mobile sort of rendition of it? Um, has that changed at all? I hope we're... Uh media agnostic yeah. from the start and, and you know channel planning. <coughs> you know, as I said, we, we want to have everyone at the table at the start and that's how we validate ideas. But definitely like mobile is is you know even when we're you know, making a traditional like video piece, um, we have to we were on set shooting something a couple weeks ago and we were just asking ourselves like so are people gonna be watching like this or like this and like right. can the actor be on that far to the right? right. And uh, maybe we're gonna cut this square at some point. So how does that We've been challenging our um, creative agency to be more responsive in terms of what they're creating. So, you know, I know that there are new IAB standards coming out, um, and those are going to really dramatically change the way that creative is being built because it's no longer going to be a pixel ratio, it's going to be actual um, screen size. So, um, that is something that, you know, it, it's not necessarily at the forefront, but because everyone's looking at everything on multiple devices. Um, it needs to work, you know, throughout the line of everything that you're on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't need to always go to the opposite end of the spectrum and say design, you know, for, for mobile. I think you need to, you know, especially with, with the effectiveness uh, of, of television still, you need to ensure that you're designing creative to match the format it's being consumed on. And, and you know, but ensuring at the starting point that, that mobile is considered in that, uh, is, is, is just key. And to your point around vertical video, I mean, that's, that's a big opportunity, and especially with autoplay without sound, how do we begin to uh, design creative to match uh, the needs of a native environment or the feed? Great. Um, so we're, we're nearing the end of our, uh, our chat, which is sad. Um, but um, I, I didn't ask uh, one more question, maybe across the board, maybe starting with Matt. Um, you know, how do you how do you see okay first of all prediction uh, for 2017 what do you think is going to be the big sort of topic in 2017 um, and then also um, sort of as an addendum uh, how do you think agencies are going to respond to that and, and maybe we can each get uh, a couple words in on that um, I'll go back to putting people at the center of every of everything we do so starting with individuals I think you know a lot of the discussion before break around uh, data and of ad tech and martech with the BNP kind of sitting in the middle and being able to actually activate those strategic audiences, those high value audiences <coughs> through media uh, is, is, is definitely the trend that we're focused on, um, on, on bringing to life instead of just you know, sitting in, on, in the white paper or, or you know, truly consulting with clients. So to the second half of your question, advising clients on, on you know, based on the press release versus reality, uh, what do we need to do? What's the roadmap to get from here to here to, to improve that consumer journey, that consumer experience um, through a combination of data and targeted media? Great. Um, for me, and this goes back to what uh, Navid and Andrew were talking about, uh, what's going to be really big is omnichannel attribution. Um, I think this is, and it actually ties into that, this one-to-one -one relationship, right? Knowing what someone's seen, what behaviors they've displayed before they've done that action or you know, signed up for credit cards, signed up for, um, signed up for a bank account. Being able to tell that 
relationship with the consumer will be really key for us. And um, we need our agency partners because they're the ones who are really gonna understand the media and you know the right balance of uh, top of the funnel to bottom of the funnel tactics in order to drive that omnichannel attribution. Uh, I'm gonna go with AI. I think, um, <laughs> I feel like uh, the- What kind of IBM uh, Watson thing? Yeah, Watson, Google, yeah. Vision APIs. Like, I, I think there's, it's, uh, it's uncannily available and accessible right now. And I think the simplicity of gluing uh, an open source um, artificial intelligence API to a data set is a huge opportunity for, for all of us, and, and especially for creative people. I like it because I, it just makes sense to me, and I think there's tons of creative opportunity. I think we're going to see a lot. That's great. And I think we all need to be more dynamic. <laughs> and, and, and agile. Yes. And agile. <laughs> you want a buzzword? Yeah. <laughs>